um, like all of you, I have some little talents that I'm developing, and one of them is cartooning, I guess, and screenwriting as well is one of those, okay? So anyways, um, I always want to do this. You know, I don't know if you saw, I'm, I'm sure you saw Blade Runner, right? Um, I've seen things most people wouldn't believe. <laughs> like the rise of a learning organization, fueled only by the enlightened self-interest of its people. Enlightened self-interest means pretty much that I do the work to improve my craft, but in doing so, I also help my teammates. And in doing so, in doing so I help my teammates grow. The team, team grows, company grows, humanity grows, the planet grows. Or maybe not. Okay, enlightened self-interest is a little bit different from what we see all around, right? Compliance. We have people pointing the gun at us and saying, you do it or else, and I'm going to check you, right? But um, I saw pretty much what, uh, what it means to have curiosity and courage put together and generate endless options. This is actually a t-shirt I did last year for the Lean Agile Scotland conference. You have the why, why, why. You know, go to root cause and really analyze what are the problems. And on the other side is more the entrepreneurial world. Why not? Okay, and I also see what it means to develop people for their ideas and contributions. All of those moments will be lost in time. I was a chief technology officer for a company. I'm Italian. I live in Ireland. We were the new company of the year in 2005. And in a very lean and agile way, we went out of business. Like tears in rain. <laughs> Today, we live in a different world. This is, uh, I don't know if you've seen this graph, like uh, it's used like for right shifting. It's the idea that most organizations actually are over there, they're not particularly effective. They're in this kind of analytical mindset where essentially people are like, Accountants, we know the cost of everything, but the value of nothing. How do we shift these companies to the right side? What do we do? It's a world where invention and innovation are replaced by organizational conformity. And knowledge development is suffocated by bureaucracy, firefighting, and command and control. These organizations are like Mars. They're hostile places, they're dead with very little to offer, to offer humans. So companies, though, they try to change, right? They go through many reorganizations. OK. It's better? Yeah. OK, fair enough. Yay. Through many reorganizations, only to stay the same. So we have the organizational chart, which I call the blame flow. It starts from the very top. We have at the very top, we have God. If you're an atheist, it's probably Godzilla. Then it's followed by the rule makers, the controllers, the enforcers, and then obviously at the end, who do we have? The losers. <laughs> but my point is that we're all victims, victims of a system. This is how we learn at school. There are, there are uh, shows like on television, there are in Ireland, in the US, and whatever, it's called The Apprentice. I don't know if you've ever seen it, if there is anything like that in France. But effectively, you have all these people who are fighting for one position, and they have two teams, and it's all about competition. They rotate the project, project management. But it's all based on scarcity. If for me to win, everybody else needs to lose. Okay? And so we create these kind of heroes that are really, you know, firefighters, command and control, and so on. So it's something we are really born with. Um, but now we have Agile, right? But the problem with Agile is that uh, the approach towards management hasn't been really effective. So we have this kind of ham and eggs, you know, little stories. You're a chicken, you shouldn't even talk. So management is seen as part of the problem. Stay away. You know, we don't want you. So what's in it for them? So you can imagine then that the typical Agile enterprise looks like this. You know, you have the teams doing building software and whatever, then you have the scrum masters serving the team, and everything else stays the same. Yeah, have you seen that? Maybe. 
And you know what? It's a war. It's a war of worlds, world of cultures, tragically consumed behind corporate walls, where the few who exercise command and control systematically crush people's hearts and minds. And it's a war we can't possibly win unless. Have you seen Total Recall? Yeah, that movie the, where you know, the guy is actually hard little Schwarzenegger, pushes the hand and then suddenly oxygen comes out of Mars. What's that called? Terraforming, yeah? That's the alien way, alien way to do it. But uh, there are actually plans in NASA as well to actually say, theoretically, can we make Mars hospitable? Can we terraform it? And, and this is the way I'm looking at it, is can we terraform organizations? What would it take? What are the simple mechanisms that we can build to do that? So let's see about lean thinking, but beyond value streams. So maybe a deep lean thinking. Uh, the typical lean came from, you know, as you know, from Toyota. After the World War II, Toyota was uh, the, the entire Japanese market was destroyed, and they struggle, and they see they can't compete with Ford, with the mass production in Ford. So they change the rules of the game. And if you see Taiki Ono, possibly, you've, you probably have seen this sentence, which is very famous, which says, all we're doing is looking at the timeline. From the moment the customer gives us an order to the point we can collect the cash. And we're reducing that timeline by removing the non-value added wastes. It's not about going faster. Yeah? It's actually looking where, say, the queues are, for example. And uh, Lean destroyed the myth that splitting work in big batches improves the economies of scale. This is one thing I learned in Agile. In Agile, it was all about changing direction, right? It wasn't necessary to go, you want to go fast, you use waterfall, you specialize. But effectively, what happened there is we created big batches. By doing Agile, working in small batches, it turns out that even if we were looking just for adapting to change, it turns out working with small batches, we actually go faster. There is some queuing theory to, to explain that. There are little games to actually to show that. But it really shows that, and this is a good lesson that Lean taught me. But also Lean provided many tools to obliterate the competition. So now we have, you know, uh, value stream mapping, Kanban, 5Ss, whatever. You know, there's so many of these tools. But the point is, to me, this is only part of the story. There is this tale of a journalist going to a Toyota plant and asking the manager, why do you allow your American competitors to go there and copy all your tools? Are you mad? And the manager answered, what they need to see is not visible. To which the journalist probably thought, what the heck is he talking about? Okay, so what we learn very often from Lean is what the Americans understood of the best of Toyota, and then we keep translating, and in the end arrives in French, God knows what arrives there, you know, in the first place. So there's, there's a lot of translations along the way, and it's very easy to just take what we see. But let me explain this like through a story. Have you seen this, this movie? Monster Inc., if you have uh, kids, probably you have. Uh, Monster Inc. is a movie from Pixar, and it's about essentially this mo parallel monster city, okay, that needs to be powered, they need energy. But this power comes from the screams of kids. So what happens is they have these kind of doors that they open, and they enter the real world of the kids, right? They enter in their bedrooms, pretty much. They really, they scare them. So it opens the closet, pretty much. They scare them, and the screen powers this energy. Take the energy, fuel the city, and so on. And I love this idea, because uh, there are very, a lot of similarities with the real world in many ways. You know, it's a system based on fear, to begin with. Uh, but then they also have like, things like leaderboards, you know, like whoever gets, you know, there's somebody who needs to get on top. But do you remember, for the ones who've seen it, how it ends? It tends that they make an observation, and the observation is that they realize that when kids laugh, they generate 10 times more power than when they scream. 
Okay? So they changed their system. Based on that observation, they changed their system. And this guy who was the sidekick does stand-up comedy instead of actually scaring the kids. And on the first kid, on the first day, they reach and probably overcome the first, the targets that they had that was set based on the previous system. Okay? So you change the system and then targets become somewhat useless. I'm not saying that I'm against targets. I'm just saying, how are we going to change the system to reach it? More than let's work even faster. Okay. So Edward Demings effectively believed that 95% or let's say a large percentage of people, a worker's performance is governed by the systems. Which is also probably why the Lean System Society, to which I'm a fellow, says improve the world by improving the systems. Don't improve the world by changing people's behavior. See the way people operate and, and change that kind of level. Okay, it's the environment around that. So perhaps, this is a perhaps, we should work on our processes, not the outcome of our processes. So in Toyota, improving and managing are one and the same. You see, like in traditional thinking, normal daily management is done, and then the improvement is an add-on, something that you add when you have time. You know, and we never have time. But then in Toyota's thinking, what you see is that normal daily management is equal to process improvement. It's exactly what they do. Some of these guys are not trained on things like value stream mapping, but they solve problems. They improve processes. So as a consequence, while in Agile we don't have the good stories, I've been doing Agile for a long time, okay? We don't have good stories for managers. What's in it for them? But in Lean, they do. You know, they're there to serve others because here you have like the scrum masters or the team leads or whatever. They're putting oil in the cog. I put them on the top. You know, the teams that are there are making money, are creating value. Let's put them on the top. Then if they are cogs in these assembly lines, you know, these scrum masters are putting oil in these cogs. But these guys only see, the scope of what they see is just the team. Who's helping them across teams? There are so many problems that are outside their, their sphere of influence or control. It has to be management. We see saying that managers have to be problem solvers. I don't think it's enough. You also have to give them methods, ideas. So there is at least one method, which is A3 thinking. And A3 thinking essentially helps develop a shared understanding of what a problem actually is and promotes this kind of systematic approach to address it. It's also used because I, I would write a report in a pencil and I, even if I don't have authority over somebody else who maybe is in a different department, I would go at launch time with just maybe the background or the current situation. I, I don't feel the entire report. It, it, this is me, Sherlock Holmes, trying to get this understanding of the problem, sitting together beside a financial officer and actually say, this is the way I see the problem. Would you agree with me? Or what do you think? And it's written in pencil, which means as well that you can change things along the way. So it's a good way to get this kind of influence. And it's also used by managers in terms of coaching because, uh, you know, if uh, you are the problem solver uh, and I'm your mentor, your job is to solve the problem, my job is to develop you. Uh, which means that you would show, you, you would show me your, so far what you've been writing on your A3 report, which is your current understanding of the problem. And I would probably ask things like, rather than say, you know, this is so bad, just forget it. I would start asking maybe Socratic questioning. Like, uh, can you clarify this? Can you put it in another way? What evidence do you have? What's the implication of this? Is it your point of view only? Is it shared with everybody else? What would you say if somebody else said something like this? What's your assumption? You know, there's a number of things that you actually use and use a report effectively as a way to communicate. So, with this, I believe, and this is you know, a partial view of, of what lean is and, is, and is actually deliberately wrong as well, which is <laughs> lean is a business strategy to make money through the development of people. If you don't like the idea of making money, first check how much money Toyota has, but secondly, also see 
uh, and actually, I, I truly believe in fat is create customer value. But the important thing to me is through the development of people. And I use deliberately in very instrumental way to make money because, a lot of, because I know a lot of bureaucratic companies whose goal is to make money, but they just can't because what they do is what pleases their boss. Yeah, so if we share at least that kind of common objective, the point being is I work with a lot of companies and some of these companies are some of the fastest growing startups in the history of the internet in terms of profitability. I know what, what it means to have that mindset of making money, but through the development of people is lean. Okay, so maybe it's not what you do, but rather what you learn by doing it that matters. Maybe. So, learning to see involves bringing to the surface what we learn. So, yes, this is the same that we had before, but I kind of wonder, how about something like that? So, I created this concept of, together with the value streams, we could have learning streams. How do we learn? And in fact, you may actually argue that an A3 report is a way to bring that kind of learning to the surface. Why in firefighting companies the firefighters are the heroes? Because nobody in management sees what a preven preventive action is. They, the prevention is not visible, you know what I mean? It's not surfaced. But my hypothesis is that if we can bring that to the surface, then there will be less space for firefighters and there will be more glory, if you want, for the ones who actually do the work to prevent constantly. So A3, I see that as a very, um, as a learning stream, essentially, that has been brought to the surface. What other learning streams can we, can we seek to, to surface? Now, I, I, there's a number of examples. I'm not going to bring them today, but, uh, you know, the more I search, the more I look, and the more I see, like, mechanisms to help people coming up with ideas and, uh, and so on. But in particular, I would like to show you something I'm working on these days, uh, which is called Lean Change, is, is one particular personal form of it, I guess. But it's effectively where you merge Lean Startup, which is something that happens in uh, Silicon Valley and, and originated from there and is expanding all over the world. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, so I use a lot of that. But actually, how do you apply Lean Startup within organizations is another interesting aspect that I'm looking at. And particularly, is how we use that to introduce change in organizations. So let me show you this kind of little uh, direction uh, by, again, telling a story. So once upon a time, there was a, a team in serious trouble. Let's not even go there like in, in the terms of trouble that the team was, but let's say they didn't deliver that often. So we walked the full value stream together, okay? So post it and actually say, how does the work go from here to there? You know, if you're in a software company, you may think that your job is to write software. You're not writing code, really. What you're doing is you're developing, it's like creating bananas. You know, what happens to bananas? They're perishable goods, yeah? So when you, when you write a spec, effectively, what you're doing is you're picking this banana from the tree. And until this banana gets to be sold, gets live somewhere, it's perishing. When it's on those, these boards, this is perishable goods. So the team as a whole is not the job of the developer to write code and the job of the tester to do the testing. It's more actually you say, how many steps do we have to go through? What is required to go from this step to, the, to this other one? And who can help? But let's clarify what it means to go from one to the other. But let's move as fast as we can. That's our job. You make it visual, you will see things like, you know, piles somewhere. You know, if there is a pile that it's before effectively releasing your software, you have a problem. I don't care if it's in your department. Visualize it all from end to end. So this is the idea from concept to cash, okay? So doing that kind of work, we created a Kanban board. Uh, this is the work as it works. And we limited working process based on their capacity and capability, which is a way effectively to move faster. We can't really uh, do a lot of things at the same time. We created explicit policies, really, what it means to go from one step to the next one. Let's make it very explicit. So, you know, many of you may have recognized the Kama method. You know, there, there are different principles around, 
around that or our different practices. And in the end, we actively manage flow and progressively gain predictability with no estimates. Whoa, 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 no estimates? <laughs> have you ever heard of it? I'm not saying that you don't have predictability. I'm saying that maybe you don't have to have very accurate estimates. You can, you know, sometimes if the stories are small enough, just count them. How many of them get to be released? Just count them. Oh, yeah, but we use point estimation, yeah? From one to eight, the average is four. <laughs> Doesn't matter, okay? So the minute that you manage to make things roughly the same, roughly, you actually use statistical analysis pretty much to predict roughly where you're going to be. You want to try to be more precise? Go to waterfall, and uh, you'll fail anyway. Anyway, um, but the real secret is not actually the fact, I mean, it, it wasn't that, okay? A lot of teams are doing Kanban, but um, the real secret was our ability to systematically create small change experiments, which I tried to surface. Okay, so we created effectively uh, what I call, again, it's a new learning stream um, on, on a change board. And this change board works pretty much like this. There are observations and insights. Oh, we should do this. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. What's the problem? So we put it in the first column. Based on that, then we create options. So your suggestion is one of a number of options. You know what I mean? So when you have people in the team who actually say, we should do, I don't know, anything, test-driven development, great, that's an option. What's the problem? Once you get to the problem, then you generate a number of options. You know what I mean? Then you have discussions, because very often what happens is people resist change, right? So we're here. But in reality, people react to change in different and unpredictable manners. So what I've always have done as a coach in the past was to say, you know, you, want to, you don't want to really do test-driven development. We don't want to switch. That's definitely an option. But how about we try it for a couple of weeks? What do you have to lose? So based on the options that are more directions, we create a backlog of possible experiments. Does it make sense? So you make it short, you make it small, but to actually to be an experiment, because saying let's try test-driven development for, for a week or two weeks is not quite an experiment. To make it an experiment the way I like it at least is to say, well, let's write down an expectation. So what we have is we have an action, an expectation, and a date on which we are going to validate the gap between the expectation and reality. Now we have an experiment. And when we do, say, retrospectives, these things are done very often just in time. You know, somebody sees a problem, writes it in the options and insights, may create one or two uh, in the observations and insights, may start actually creating one option, may start to create another one, and then other people jump in and we have a number of options. But based on that, we create this backlog of experiments. Then if you do retrospectives, I hope you do, um, you know, we have these discussions. But in the retrospectives, I effectively do a routine, a kata. People know exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to ask a number of questions, which is pretty much, let me see here. What experiments did we agree to pursue? Which ones did we actually run? What did we expect to happen? What actually happened? And what did we learn? This is a sequence, okay? They know exactly what's going to happen. And I actually add it as an extra column to the Kanban board because I don't want to be the one who actually runs it all the time. It's completely self-sufficient, okay? They know exactly what questions to ask, even themselves. And I heard a number of questions even yesterday, and it seems like there's a big issue in terms of fear of failure. <laughs> I don't know if you agree, but... Uh, so certainly some people fear failure, right? And uh, I remember months ago, it, it, Somebody on Twitter said, the gap between an expectation and reality is frustration. And I said, well, to me, the gap between expectation and reality is learning. If we actually, if we all the time, we obtain what we expect, so I write an expectation first, in two weeks' time I'm going to validate it, and then I see there is, a, I, I always meet my expectations, yeah, I, 
effectively, I did what I expected to happen. It happened what I expected to happen. But when it doesn't, maybe there is an opportunity for learning. Why did it not happen? Why it wasn't exactly how we expected? Okay? And things that we expect, maybe, you know, if you think in terms of the experiments, some of them are certainly quantitative, but other ones, other ones may be qualitative. Cyril, let's do test-driven development in two weeks' time. At the end of the two weeks, let's, uh, I expect that I like it and you like it, and we want to continue doing that. It's completely subjective, right? But there is an expectation. And, you know, it takes courage and tremendous act of personal leadership to make a difference. But today I see a lot of teams who are actually run in this kind of system and generate five to 10 experiments every week. This is a continuous flow of experiments. You know, when I see teams like that, if once the CEO said, you know, how is this team doing? Check the exchange board, have a look at it. And you have these teams generating a lot of change experiments. That's a learning team that, you know, we're building and terraforming starting from there. Now, one thing I want to ask is, uh, is this limited to software development? Of course not. I'm using it with my family. <laughs> but imagine a continuous flow of experiments to dramatically accelerate the rate of change in every corner of your organization. Same CEO said to me, you know, I'm jealous. I want you to help me on the sales team. <laughs> and I'm working now with two sales teams in two different organizations. Why? Because you could have two approaches. One is to get the experienced sales guy that comes from the outside, tells you exactly what to do and how to improve your target, uh, you know, from, you know, of 10%. Uh, or maybe you can actually have somebody who helps you actually build up these systems where people learn to improve themselves and make observations about even the market outside. You know what I mean? This is a completely shift in, in mindset. So how far would you go? <laughs> but okay, that's fine. So we get this kind of idea of uh, learning, learning streams and whatever. But how do we know that we are actually creating value? You know, changing, changing, changing. Because after all, as Jeff Patton once taught me, if you get good at delivering shit faster, you just get a lot of shit. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> And uh, I want to hear, like, to talk about Lean Startup, um, again, with a story, a uh, personal story. So some time ago, I decided to write a book on A3 Thinking. I'm a strong believer, like, in A3 Thinking, as a methodology served me really well. But again, you know, the biggest waste of all, you know, I said, well, what did I say before? It was a new company of the year, operational excellence. We did all this stuff. Yeah, it still didn't work. And the reason is we had a lot of assumptions and, you know, we didn't validate these opinions and these models didn't exist. And yes, there's a high percentage of companies who don't survive, okay? But that didn't, didn't help me feeling better. I burned millions. They weren't mine, but at the same time, I feel, I feel bad about that. And so when Lean Startup actually came over, uh, I started actually studying these models and apply them. So anyways, and here's the point. I wanted to write a book on A3 Thinking and I made a set of assumptions because I, I didn't want to write a book that nobody wants. So what I did, I began writing those assumptions in a, what is called a lean canvas, where effectively you say, okay, who is this for? Who are my potential customers? We're talking about, I don't know, managers and change agents. What are their top three problems? What are their existing alternatives? What would be my solution? In this case, maybe chapters in the book or whatever. Uh, what's the unique value proposition? What's the unfair advantage? Why not me or and why not somebody else? Uh, channels, I'm going to buy this and whatever. So, uh, and then the cost and whatever. You can imagine that these are a set of assumptions which once they were done with a big, long business plan. These are what the plausible lies are all about, right? You're getting a funding, you want to get the funding. But in this case, like in one page, not only I can create a business model very quickly, I can create several business models. And based on that, I can actually say, I think actually I'll pick this one and that one. And then I start to iterate and validate. So, and the data is not in your building. 
And I actually want to think, to help you consider that even if you are in a large organization, there is a big chance that there is an opportunity for entrepreneurship within the organization. I work with a lot of large organizations who actually have teams that are practically isolated for the rest of the organization and they work towards a uncharted territory because maybe they have a new product that they need to try and test, okay? So, so anyways, by doing that, what it means actually to go out of the building? It means that pretty much you go there, you interview people and actually say, is this a problem? That's your question. Is it a problem worth solving? This is what I'm trying to get to. So I go there and for the book, I, I wrote actually my assumptions on three, four index cards. I put them on the table, when it, and, and I did the same virtually, effectively, but if I was like literally on a coffee table, I would say, here's my assumption. I would read them, and would say, is there anything that I haven't talked about in terms of problem solving that you feel strongly about? So it's one of those kind of open questions, because you are essentially you're sourcing out, trying to see if there's anything missing. And if they answer, particularly very often at the beginning, you may not have covered certain areas that people really feel strong about. So you write it down. Then you say, okay, let's, let's rank them. Which one goes first? You know, one, two, three, whatever. Okay, interesting. You put this one on top. How are you solving this problem today? You see, I could have asked, you know, from one to five, how important it is. People lie to you, plus their, their scale is different from mine. What I want to see is if they try to solve this problem before with anything, you know, with sally tape or whatever, there is a big chance that maybe it's a problem worth solving. And particularly if I have a better solution, they will even buy from me. Okay? This is called customer development, by the way. You know, I'm going there asking for their expertise, you know. But then what happens is you also ask, uh, so this is how I'm thinking about my solution. Um, you know, what do you think about that? And would you be interested to be kept up to date as I develop these ideas? And, you know, I'm really trying to solve a problem that these guys... Um, feel they have, okay? If it's, a not, if it's not a problem worth solving, uh, you will very quickly get there. It may be the wrong customer segment, it could be, you know, whatever. But the point being, if it's not a problem worth solving, if 10 people say, bad idea, you know, you don't need a lot of statistical analysis there to actually consider that maybe it's not a good idea. So you, you change it, you pivot. So anyways, then what you ask is, is things like, and I have that as a script, I guess, in, in my mind, but this is literally the sequence. And I would say, so would you mind to be kept up to date? And more importantly, is there anybody else in your role, in your organization, or maybe outside your organization who could also give me feedback? So when somebody says it's difficult to penetrate in, an, uh, in enterprises, I beg to differ. <laughs> there are sometimes there are systems that actually enable you to get quickly to other places. I picked up the phone, called the head of the lean office in Siemens. I worked there before. And from there, I moved to Ericsson's, Bearing Point, Microsoft, Silicon Valley, and whatever, very quickly. Yeah? I had the common board with all the interviews and waiting for their follow-ups and uh, peer introductions, because that's what's interesting. When you say, is there born anybody else? They don't just give you a name, they say, but let me introduce you, <laughs> which I found uh, interesting. So you see, actually using all this kind of validation and constant validation means pretty much that I'm working on this circle of having an idea, uh, so you build a product, uh, you measure the outcome of that product and you learn. Or you can work it the other way is, what do I need to learn? What kind of measurement can I use? And what do I need to build effectively in order to get that information? So you can read it both ways. So how do I practically do it? Because I see a lot of companies that actually drink the lean startup Kool-Aid and they start with the canvas and then it kind of, the canvas becomes like a, something frozen over there. You know what I mean? Um, you know, how does that happen? So this is what I do, essentially. I have a, have a board, an experiment board, and it's very similar to the one that I use with, with the other teams. You know, like, in that case, we had the value stream and the learning stream. Here is somewhat the value stream is parallel to the learning stream, is one and the same. So what I have, again, is uh, goals, and then observation and insights, open questions, targets, and options, 
and then I create these experiments, and then I validate them, and in the end I create a knowledge base. So in other words, what I do is that I execute tasks to develop features that are part of experiments that I run to validate hypotheses or to uh, exercise options that I formulate thanks to observations about the world around me. And effectively what happened was that my mindset shifted from the concept to cash idea, the value stream, to this kind of idea from question to knowledge base. So I ask questions, I get answers to those questions. And it's actually an integral part of my workflow. So ironically, I never write that book, never wrote it. And the reason is that people needed something to help them when and where it mattered, mattered most, which is where they work. So I tested an idea with a low fidelity, minimum valuable products. Thinking is not driven by answers, it's driven by questions. So I created this kind of brainstorming cards to actually help people to write these A3s, like, and, you know, lots of questions for each single field. Um, and, I, and I tried actually with glue and paper. You know when you say build software? Hmm, wait, glue and paper. Put it in the hand of a guy from Pfizer who actually gave me some, some advice on the manufacturing side. And then I went to the Lean Enterprise Software and System Conference in Boston and I had a lot of peers. And so I put it in their hands and I said, God, Claudio, I'm going to pay 20 euro for this. And another guy said, Actually, Joachim over there said, I will pay 25 if you give me these 10 cards with me. I only had 10 cards. You know, I was just testing things. I didn't want to build everything. So I only had 10 cards. And then another guy an hour later says, I would have paid double. Okay. So, and that's the printed version. And then I went live with uh, an iPhone app, an Android app. And, uh, and then finally I went live with these with this tools, essentially these physical brainstorming cards. Now, I had this goal, Toyota supplier in two years or less. My point is I'm a crafter, craftsman. I wanted to create something that is so good that even senior management in Toyota would buy it. You know, it's like selling ice cream to the Eskimo. And it turns out two months later after I went live, I, I had the chair of the global best practices in Toyota who actually financial services who bought hundreds, hundreds. And it's been joined by companies like Honeywell, a few in Spotify, uh, Nissan North America, um, oh, so many, Lockheed Martin, so probably make bombs. Um, but also two research, cancer research laboratories. And then there's people who are actually doing social activism who are using them. There's one guy who said, I'm going to use this in North America. We have a huge, in my hometown in Washington, we have a lot of black and white 50-50. A friend of mine in South Africa, I said, is going to raise uh, essentially the education. There's a lot of poverty over there. Raise the education so that they have open data that helps others. And just to, f I guess as a conclusion, the point being to me is that I moved from being a crafter, craftsman, to a problem solver, you know, you have uh, problems, you solve these problems, you know, somebody's problems is your opportunity. You know, it's a different mindset. It's like moving from perfectionist to achievement. And then there is another mindset, is this idea that we can do activism through invention. This is not social activism, but certainly this understanding that by inventing stuff, we can change really the world in meaningful ways. So I want to leave you with this which is pretty much, uh, it's not what you do, but rather what you learn by doing it that matters. But then, it's not what you learn, but rather what you do with it that matters. And with this, I thank you. Okay. Maybe one. <laughs> Any question? I'll be around anyways today. Uh, if you have any question, please stop me anytime. Too much altogether? <laughs> Lot of to experiment. Oh, okay. What, what do you think about uh, having just one experiment at a time to be able to know if this one is actually uh, improving the system or if you 
if you try uh, several at a time, at the same time, how do you know if... Uh, with yeah, so a lot of people are looking for this kind of precision. You know, it has to be like a sort of a laboratory kind of experiment. I'm more of the kind of the idea that most teams are pretty, most companies and most teams are pretty bad at introducing change in the first place. So I'm more into saying any change is good change as long as you get into that kind of frame set of doing a lot of it. So I'm not that, uh, I guess this is the difference again between perfectionism and, uh, you know, I, I'm totally aware that there's a lot of bias as well on how we design these experiments and whatever because we write expectations based on what we know in a way. But um, yeah, so I'm not really looking into that kind of isolation. I, I really look at the idea of quantity. When I'm in this mindset, okay, and, and the reason is, I use this for complex systems, okay? So if we think in terms of root cause analysis, stuff that would be more common in A3 thinking, uh, where we go down to root cause analysis, that, that's very good for a certain level of complication. But when you go and work with complex systems, it's more about probing the system, which is, you know, let's try this. Let's, let's probe the system by introducing something. And so I, I prefer actually to say, you know, let's try different things and let's see what works. As long as they're small, it's not a big waste. Thank you. Okay, I think maybe just another one. Yep. Or maybe not. Just over there. Hello, thank you. Um, how do you convince organization to give some slack so that people uh, stop working on the emergency, firefighting, and work on what is important? How do you convince them? How do you convince them? Um, sometimes I just do it, essentially. It's like I don't ask, as a developer, I wouldn't ask a manager if I can write an if, <laughs> right, in my, conditionally in my codes. Yeah, you wouldn't ask that, so there are certain things that I just do. This is part of something you would introduce as part of retrospectives, for example, stuff that they have already in place, and maybe it's not as uh, articulated or, or so regimented in many ways. Um, but other things are, it, you know, it's a mix of storytelling. Sometimes I may, you know, even show a presentation like that and, and capture their imagination. Again, it's a matter of logos, pathos, and ethos. You know, ethos is who you are. Fellow of the Lean System Society. Maybe I know my stuff, I don't know. Uh, but then you have pathos that is actually to say, what's the consequence of leaving things as they are? Are you happy with your current performance? What if you continue this? And uh, what, what is going to be like in a year from now? You know, so sometimes you leverage urgency. Um, and then you use this kind of rationale, I guess, which is the logos part. So again, it's, it's using, you know, in a way, rhetoric to actually understand how to influence people. And uh, it, it's a mix of all of these things. I guess it's a pot of magic as well. I don't know what happens, but they do it. <laughs> okay, I think time is up, definitely. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, thank you.